There's, you know, vagina, teeth, and tentacles. I don't know what more you could want in a book besides that. Welcome back to Visited by Voices Live for our third Writers' Roundtable. I am joined today by Gary Bronbeck, multiple uh, Stoker Award winner, educator, and true north for a whole lot of compasses inside the genre. How are you, Gary? Thank you. Pretty good. Pretty good. I just turned 61 yesterday, so I'm Happy in work. a much better mood than I thought I would be. Well, so the, the, cake, this, cake always helps. <laughs> this may all end in a group singing "Happy Birthday" to you. I'm just going to warn uh, you. No, nope, if it does, I'll, I'll, I will. I will disappear faster than, than than Donald Trump did when he left the White House. I, I promise. No promises. You. No promises. <laughs> also joining me today is Stoker Award-winning novelist of the Bone Weaver's Orchard, Sarah Reed. Hello. How are you doing tonight? Doing good. Glad to be here and talking with everyone. Awesome. Also today, I am joined with, by, not with, by, uh, Stoker Award-winning author of The Devil's Dreamland, poetry inspired by H.H. H. Holmes, Sarah Tetlinger. Hello. Hey. So, Sarah, how are we going to differentiate between the Sarahs tonight? I can just be Sarah T, or, or Professor T, if you want to be like my student. Professor T. <laughs> that. <laughs> You might be starting something you don't want to finish with uh -oh. Professor T. <laughs> and finally, last but certainly not least, I am joined by Broken Frontier and Ghastly Award-winning author of The Empty Man, one of my favorite things on the planet, uh, the, Bo <laughs> the Bone Parish, Harrow County, and uh, guy who's worked on X-Men, Deadpool, and a lot of more of your favorite comics, Mr. Cullen Bunn. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Awesome. No, thank you guys for all coming back on board. All of you are veterans of the show, and all of you are beloved by the community here, so they're going to love seeing you again. I wanted to start the conversation today talking about a little bit about cornerstone of our genre, which is the monsters of the day. Um, in the same way that Frankenstein was Mary Shelley's uh, reaction to a world where academia and medicine and technology was increasing at a rate that was frankly frightening, or Bram Stoker was responding to the idea of old European customs and a feudal society re-emerging in new, or at least contemporary Europe. Every generation kind of finds their monsters um, to, and that's what makes horror relatable and effective. So I just wanted to ask, go around the board and ask you guys, what do you think today's monsters are, or what, or aspirationally, what do you hope they become? Let's start with Sarah T, Professor T. <laughs> All right. I, you know, I just, I've been seeing a lot of open calls for eco horror. And I think that's a really prominent one right now, just because that's something we can all relate to is the earth not doing so hot or too hot. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see how people tack, tackle eco horror because it could be like, a literal monster that you kind of create from all these different things happening or i just wrote a short story and sent it off to you know submission space where i wrote from um the point of view of clouds that are all disappearing one by one so there's a lot of different ways that you can tackle eco horror so i think that's a big one there's so many too but i think eco horror is just one that i'm really into so i'm happy to talk about that one cool cullen what do you see on in the in the zeitgeist today and on the horizon for tomorrow well i definitely see uh as sarah t said uh eco horror is big i mean i just got yesterday uh, a kickstar a book from a kickstarter I back called the green inferno which is basically uh, an eco horror anthology comic and prose anthology 
Um, and uh, and look, I think it's 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 overdue. I remember, uh, I think fondly and often about uh, Skip Inspector's The Bridge, which I think is one of the greatest eco horror novels of all time, and it, it haunts me to this day. And I read it twenty something years ago. Um, I also think uh, we're going to be seeing uh, a lot more of uh, information as the monster, information and the lack of the ability to communicate information to one another will become a, a big rep. We'll see a lot of that uh, somehow uh, horrors and monsters representing that coming uh, down the down the pipe. Absolutely. Sarah R., what do you have? Yeah, I really like what Cullen just said about, you know, information. Um, I'm in library school right now studying information science, and, you know, we just had a big unit on um, big data and, <laughs> and what really goes on with with your personal information <laughs> when you're not looking and <laughs> it give you nightmares. So, yeah, I definitely see um, kind of a, a digital horror emerging the kind of an almost existential digital horror uh that probably ties in really well with eco horror in a way like what sarah was saying it's all all kind of one big web of what have we done to ourselves <laughs> <laughs> gary um well before i um, answer the question i wanted to recommend a book to everyone here um the poet ted hughes wrote a, a pair of uh of YA novels. One was The Iron Giant, which was made into a wonderful animated film. But he did this, he did a sequel called um, the, uh, I, I believe that the title of it is The Iron Lady or The Iron Woman. And you want to talk about an eco horror novel that was geared toward, you know, it's, it's geared toward the same young audience that The Iron Giant was geared toward. But Hughes very much had concerns about how we are treating the earth on his mind when he wrote the sequel to it and it's it's a rather unnerving piece of work so if you're talking you know eco horror you might want to go and check that one out because it's 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 incredible um now as far as the monsters that the um, if you're talking about um the the, the genre itself the monsters that we have now, unfortunately, all begin with the letter Z. And I'm not going to say the word, uh, but I think that's just about run its course, or at least I hope that's run its course. And what I would like to see happen in, um, in the shadow of what we've all been through with COVID is I think that there may be a uh, trend of isolationist horror that's going to start coming our way. And uh, I think a lot of the monsters from that are going to be like monsters of the psyche that emerge because of um, because of the isolation that certain characters have been forced to deal with. And uh, I actually think that would be kind of a cool direction for the genre to take for a while, because then you would be dealing with monsters that come from within rather than monsters that are, you know, the boogeyman that is attacking us from without. And I'd like to see more of that. Uh, but because of COVID-19, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more isolationist style horror stories. I, I think all of you have brought up incredible, incredible, timely subjects for, for the future. Um, I think that I, I just finished writing a novel about uh, that kind of updated the body snatcher trope to today because identity theft is such a real part of yeah. everyone's life. Everyone who logs onto a computer every day runs the risk of a pot under your bed, right? So, <laughs> so I think that's a thing. But I think um, one thing that COVID, because that's that that really was Gary very much where my head was at too. Not just the isolation though, also the division. Yeah. How 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 a society can become so divided, and no matter what you believe on a subject, the division itself is probably the scariest part. The fact that you wake up one day and you just find that you're not even speaking the same language as your neighbor because their beliefs are so different. And how did that happen so quickly to us? You know, what, what, were we simmering for years like a frog in a pan or did it really just happen as quickly as it felt? And I think our genre is one that is so adept at these kind of discussions because exaggeration is baked into the, the cake, as it were. Yeah. 
Yeah, one of the books I was recommending to people a lot this year, because that's how it, it felt to me, was kind of Mayville's The City in the City, where the two cities of completely different, you know, they're different cities, but they're occupy the same space, but they're not allowed to cross over in any way. And I felt like I was living in a different city <laughs> in the same space <laughs> as the people around me. And yeah, it's a very uncanny feeling, definitely. Yeah, um, I was reading, uh, uh, I read it years ago and the, the idea of it started in, uh, in David Wong's John Dies at the End, they talk about the Babel threshold which I have, I mean, comic horror novel or not, that Babel threshold concept yeah. was uh, uh, dead on the money because it's the moment where we're going to get, we're going to reach a point where we can no longer communicate with one another. And I think we've already reached it. I think we may have already started tipping past that threshold, but, uh, but that, that scares the hell out of me. I just uh, watched an Indian horror movie called Chatham Makar which is um, The Hidden Face. And it's about internet addiction as a horror trope. And um, I mean, you can't get more timely than that. I mean, take, take, take someone away from their smartphone for an hour and see what they're doing. They start fidgeting like a junkie. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of a scary thing to me too, because where's that information coming from? Really, where's that information that we're so addicted to coming from? And you know, how do we know that it's accurate? is right. another thing i mean be, so many people can you know they they read something that's you know just barely outside the conspiracy theory um oeuvre so to speak and they take it they take it as law because well it's on the internet it must be true yeah no that, yeah, see, that a... scares me you know that's that's uh, the people can be so easily swayed by uh misinformation yeah, yeah. There's a... it's an information literacy epidemic yeah how it's being talked about <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a documentary on netflix right now called the social dilemma yes and, uh, it is yeah. the scariest horror movie you'll watch <laughs> yeah. i mean it's the scariest thing you can possibly watch it's terrifying and deep fakes scare the hell out of me like people can really manipulate and photoshop things to make it look so real you're just scrolling by and you could see yeah. anything and not register it as being off or fake at first like that's terrifying especially if you're out there in the public and people can just like take your face and do things with it that's yep. yeah. horror. and you know <laughs> unless you have uh, unless you have the right software that you can you know break it down and say well this is where they faked this and this is where they faked that yeah you know it uh, you, you could be led to believe almost anything and now they're coming out with software to scrub those blurred lines where things have been faked and oh, good. You know, good. 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 the metadata. Yeah. And <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because uh, in 81, there was a television anthology series called Dark Room, which is mostly forgotten today. But the James very Coburn. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's, in my opinion, yeah. the best anthology has ever so, been on television. Not to interrupt, but as a kid, when Dark Room would come on, the opening scene, the opening uh, credits of Dark Room with them yeah. moving, it was like a camera panning through an old house. Yeah. It scared me so bad as a child. I, I mean, it terrified me, and I never even got to the episode. Yeah. The credits yeah. scared me. The opening, yeah. the op the first episode of the series was about a newscaster who one day is simply replaced by a computer version of himself. So in 81, they were talking about what's scaring us today as reality. Yeah. Um Michael Crichton did a movie in the early 80s that was just, it bombed at the box office and it was panned by critics, but it was called Looker. Mm -hmm. And it dealt with the same theme, except that once these, you know, these models have been entered into, you know, the virtual world, they're murdered. And so you don't really have the need for an actual human being. It's like taking the, um, it's like taking the idea of, um, if I can remember, I can't remember what the term is, but uh, the uncanny valley. It's like taking, you know, the concept of the uncanny valley ten steps beyond what it is now. So yeah, yeah, um, the movie Looker dealt very much with the same themes. What's crazy is that all those Marvel films, um, they actually start their previs work on those films years in advance of them being shot. 
and they have scans of all their actors. Oh yeah. So, so hypothetically, we may be on the verge of actors never aging or dying in our entertainment. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what they did with uh, uh, to Brendan Lee and The Crow and Oliver Reed in um, Gladiator. Gladiator. Yeah. You know, he, the the scene where he's talking to uh, Russell Crowe through that gate, Reed had been dead 10 days when they put that scene together. And that's, you know, for one, for one thing, you get to see this great actor in his final performance, but at the same time, he wasn't there. there. And that creeps the shit out of me <laughs> it's it it may strictly speaking qualify as the definition of a ghost it might yeah yeah capture on film i would agree so, so yeah. sarah you actually use the word uncanny and that's actually the second topic i wanted to hit i've always felt that true horror to be, uh, the scariest horror embraces the uncanny rather than the frightening um, those creepy moments that we feel like something is off, but we can't quite figure out what's off, always affected me a whole lot more than any monster on the page or any jump scare in a film. It was just those quiet, creeping, subtly off, but hard to define moments. How do we get that in our fiction? And how do we maintain that for an audience that's growing up on first person shooter video games? Well, for me, the uncanny relies on uncertainty which generates anxiety so that's what how i play with it when i'm writing um once you've revealed the monster then you switch from anxiety to planning <laughs> that's strategy mode now you're trying to figure out how to defeat the monster but if you can't find it or don't know what it is or don't know what's going on then you're just in you can't you can't plan your survival at that point all you can feel is anxiety so trying to place those moments strategically and prolong them <laughs> to invoke that anxiety in a, in a reader is, is a lot of fun. Um, what well, Charles O. Grant constantly referred to as quiet horror. You know, the thing in the shadows is much more scary if you don't bring it out of the shadows. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, that, I, that's a type of horror that, that I personally prefer. Um, not that all horror has to be that way. I mean, Ramsey Campbell can get as, as graphic as the best of them, but he has, I think, cornered the market on that type of subtle corner of the eye type of uh, anxiety and unease. Absolutely. Uh, the unnameable might be... Mm -hmm. Or, or the nameless, I'm sorry, the nameless may be um, the master class in that. Uh, so, Professor T. <laughs> I think a really good example of the uncanny is something that we're seeing now with wearing masks, especially the ones that have like faces printed on them. Like you're looking at someone and their face just isn't quite right. And from a distance, you might not know why, unless it's like, I don't know, a beard and this person shouldn't be having a beard or something. But even still, if it looks convincing enough, you have to kind of get up close and um, I think it's Robert Block that has that famous quote about horror is the removal of masks. So it's kind of literally removing that mask. And then, um, oh, I read a really good article that talked about people going to the doctor's office and having like um, the nurses all wore masks with like smiley faces and things on them to try to make the people feel at ease. But I think that sounds super creepy. Like that would disturb me. That would give me anxiety if I was at the doctor's office and there's all these smiley masks at me. Um, so there's so much happening right now that we can take literally metaphorically make our own allegories with, um, especially in terms of the uncanny because we have so many of those peaks and valleys constantly being thrown at us with the news with covid with masks um and it's it's hard to do it right in the moment but i think as we go on just all of this subconscious stuff that's happening in our minds with everything right now definitely come through in our fiction one way or another i was going to say um since you work or your your best known work is in the form of poetry the uncanny is like a big part of your arsenal i would imagine Rather, because it's kind of, again, built into the format. 
Yeah, I think especially with um, the Devil's Dreamland poetry inspired by H.H. H. Holmes, like he was so good at conning people. You have to play into their anxieties and their fears of the unknown to con people really well. And I think that's what we do with writing is we're kind of conning people into believing what we're trying to sell them. We're selling them a story. That's our product that we're getting across. So you really have to figure out what grips people and makes them want to come into your uncanny presence and then terrify them. But at the same time, your poetry is more concerned with mood, tone, and dread than it is with throwing a bunch of uh, of hackneyed, cliched, bloody images at the reader. Uh, I find a lot of horror poetry to be just so self-conscious as to almost be self-satire. And your stuff never, never, never comes anywhere near that. Um, because you approach it more. I, you can tell that you're also a, a short story writer because there is always a narrative thread. It may be it may not be visible or uh, recognizable to the reader upon the first reading, but on the second or third, it begins to emerge. And that's the type of, of literature that the field needs to produce more of, so. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Cullen, so you work in graphic fiction. Um, so that on the surface, it would seem like that's more of a overt horror mainstay, but actually your work does actually get into those like extremely shadowy, what is real, what is unreal feelings all the time. Much to the chagrin of most of my editors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a, uh, yeah, comics, you know, I, I work primarily in a very graphic medium. So there's a visual element and, uh, and the lie that comic book creators have told themselves for years, decades, is that you have to show the monster right away. You have to show the visual interpretation of the horror. And, uh, and that's not true. That's, you know, that, that's uh, what really, when we get into the uncanny of it, it's the same thing that works in prose, is you dig into the character and it's what the character is unsettled by. It's what upsets the character. It's what makes you worry for those characters. Everything because everything ha everything has to be filtered through their sensibilities. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so, uh, so, yeah. Look, most of the books I write, I, I mean, I will. It's, it's, it's. More often than not, I get notes. Can we move some sort of graphic horror or monster up sooner in the book? And my answer is typically, no, we can't, because this is where it has to happen, because this is when it will, we've built up at that point that it's giving mm -hmm. have impact, because at that point, the reader has bought in to the character's point of view, and hopefully they care about that character, or they hate, I don't care if they hate the character, love the character, as long as they care in some way about that character. Yeah, well, don't we need to develop what's wrong with the situation before we throw the threat if we're going to have real stakes. I mean, otherwise we're losing characters that we'd never really cared about their world. To begin with, right? I think, I think we have to develop what's right with the situation. We have to show what the world is supposed to look like and then uh, upturn that apple cart and show that things are going wrong. So I think, you know, I think we even need to take a step back, you know, a little bit further. Yeah. This is what it's supposed to look like. And this is how it mess. This is this is how it starts to go wrong, and this is why it's so awful. And I wonder if that's one of the big reasons. I saw two films recently that I hated um, with a passion. One of them is Army of the Dead. The other one is The Forever Purge. There is no sense of normalcy to return to in either of those movies. And then you throw characters that are frankly brash and uninteresting on top of it, and I just became like so uninvested in what was going on. I, couldn't, I can't even say I was divested of what was going on because I was never invested to begin with. Yeah. Douglas Winter t um, referred to that type of film and that type of novel and story as being anti-horror. Because like you said, there's no sense of normal, you know, with um, Army of the Dead, there's no sense of normalcy going into the damn thing. And there's definitely no sense of normalcy at the end of it. So, you know, where is the arc? Uh, there, there's no character arc. There's no thematic arc. Um, it's just sort of this, this, this sameness from start to finish, and you leave with you leave with nothing. 
And I, I remember the, my first time reading through Frank Belknap, Belknap Long, realizing that what he was doing so well was suckering me into the story. It, it really was kind of what you're talking about. Uh, it was giving you a sense of what I wanted to happen and then robbing me of it, but doing it in an extremely elegant way. Uh, so the third topic I want to cover. So when you ask a lot of readers, because the reading pool is getting smaller, unfortunately, those many who remain are more passionate than ever and how they're reading is changing definitely, but there's just less readers out there than there ever has been before, even though we have a bigger population than ever before. I come across the phrase, I don't read horror all the time from people who then, when you ask what they do read, manage to list four or five things that I consider part of the genre almost instantaneously. How do we get past this stigma and have people em either embrace horror as a genre or the title horror, whichever the problem really is? Um, I realize I've been yammering a lot and I, I apologize. So if somebody wants to tell me to shut up, please do. But I always point people toward Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And specifically, the scene where Bob Cratchit comes back to the house after visiting Tiny Tim's grave. Because what he says is, I saw the place where he will be buried. Because at that time, when somebody died, the body had to stay in the house until it was collected. And so if you think about that, you've got this the body of this poor little boy who's upstairs and rotting, which is creepy and stomach churning but at the same time the scene itself is so sadly poetic that you have to find a way to reconcile those two elements the elements of the horrific with the elements of the the emotional the uh the poignant and that's why a christmas carol is one of the classic horror stories in my opinion because it shows how you can take the two elements that are that should be best represented by the genre and how they work together beautifully to create this, for lack of a better term, cognitive dissonance um, for the reader. You know, how do you reconcile these two things? It's, it's sad, but it's horrific at the same time. And I love that sort of thing. And I think that the genre can do that and do that very well. That's the piece that I always point readers to who say, I don't read horror. So Sarah, Sarah R, you are uh, our librarian of the bunch. This is really your problem, right? We can just ha hand this to you and walk away. <laughs> well, the thing is that a lot of librarians are going to tell you, Lauren, is that people are actually reading more these days than they used to for a long, a long time. Especially young people, um, Gen Z is reading more than Boomers ever read. So there's hope. <laughs> I also have a rule that anyone who tells me that people don't read anymore has to come work a shift at my library for me. So if you're not busy on Friday, Lauren, I'd love a Friday off. So um, I start heading this way and <laughs> you can see how many books come pouring through the wall on a Friday afternoon at my library. <laughs> it's an avalanche. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think I think it's actually a really exciting time because people are reading more, and I I see a lot of people and you know whether or not they want to call it horror. Of course, it irritates them when they don't know what it is. But whether or not they're calling it horror, I love the fact that they're reading it anyway. Um, I have a talk I give sometimes to classes called Horror Is Everywhere, and I usually pull a few examples from different genres of books like. This is shelved in romance, but <laughs> or you know, we have this over in you know our general fiction section, but it's horror and kind of talking about the different elements that are are so cross genre friendly um, in terms of what makes a story a horror story and 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 a lot of times people find that what they're enjoying about that genre they think they like that's not horror is actually horror. And then they move into books that are you know, official horror and find themselves at home there. So it's it's kind of fun. I love 
playing that that um, book matchmaker game with someone, finding out what it is about a title that someone's actually enjoying, and then finding another book for them that they would never have picked up on their own, but that you know maybe maybe they love. Professor, <laughs> I love how Sarah put that. Um, Sometimes people just don't know that something has horror in it, or they just don't label it that way. And it's hard because horror might always have a stigma to certain people, and I don't know if there's anything we can do about that. Um, it's just kind of, I guess, trying to educate people that, hey, you could say Sylvia Plath has some horrific things in her poetry or something like that. and. I think I've seen a lot of um, like crossover between genres right now, especially all the different subgenres. So we see horror in so much. And I think if we just keep encouraging people to keep reading, as Sarah said, I don't know if it necessarily matters what they're reading. We might be able to just point out the horror elements in it anyway to people. Um, I don't know, that's a really good question. There's a lot to unpack there with how people think of horror, how different it is to people. Like a book about grief could be really horrific to someone and it might just be a sad book to someone else. Um, so hopefully people just keep reading and we have awesome librarians like Sarah to help push them to yeah, the horror. Who could also, uh, librarians like Sarah could also be very sneaky. If someone comes <laughs> up and asks for like a reading recommendation, well, you pull out, like say, Cormac McCarthy's uh, Blood Meridian, which is one of the most horrific novels you will ever read. But he's considered, you know, high literature. So mm -hmm. they're going to say, oh, OK, well, this isn't, you know, one of those, you know, tacky genre books. So I'm going to take this home and read it. Or you hand them something like Carson McCullers, The Battle of the Sad Cafe, which along with uh, Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find and Faulkner's Rose for Emily. Those three stories, I think, were the genesis of what is now called Southern Gothic. Um, but nobody would really think, with the exception of maybe Rose for Emily, Nobody would really think of any of those as being horror stories. So you can be really sneaky about it. And when they bring it back, you'll say, oh, I, I love this Carson McCullers novella. And you say, yeah, yeah, that's a horror story. <laughs> you don't say. Yeah, you, know, you could do that. I, I kind of like to do that, too, when I encounter people who say I don't read horror. Because why? Well, you know, I see all the movies. <sighs> and that's when I killed him, Your Honor. You know? Um, <laughs> I do that Colin. sneaky thing all the time, Gary. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, I, I would just say, I, you know, it's kind of piggybacking on what, what everybody else has said. I don't know that you can convince someone that doesn't read, that doesn't read horror, that they should read a horror book or that they have read horror in the past. You can't. You can't convince anybody of anything. So that's fine. So all I can do is see what they liked. Chances are they like something that's, you know, a horrific story, and I can refer them to something else. Most of the time, it's something I've written, but <laughs> it can't be other people have written. Um, but I think it's just that, you know, it's the same thing with, com you know, with comic books. You know, you hear all the time, I don't like, uh, I don't like comic book movies. I don't like comic book movies. That's because they have developed a an interpretation of what a comic book movie is. And you might ask someone, did you like Road to Perdition? Oh, yeah, I love Road to Perdition. Well, that's a comic book movie. Did you like yeah. A History of Violence? I loved History of Violence. That's a comic book movie. Uh, did you like 300? I love 300. I love Sparta and dudes running around stabbing other dudes. That's a comic book movie. So the thing is, they're just like comic book movies, and there are, there are horror stories that will appeal to everyone for some reason. They may not think it's a horror story, and that's okay. I know what I am. I know what I write. I write horror. And it took me a little bit to really come to grips with that from a from a personal uh, branding and marketing perspective. I was like, what do I say? Do I Am I a horror writer? Am I not? No, I write horror. And if someone thinks what I write is horror, that's great. If they don't, that's great, too. If they liked it, I don't care. As long as they read it, yeah. Yeah, if they read it and like it, if they don't think it's horror, that's fine. My wife hates horror. She hates it. Over the pandemic, we've watched tons of horror movies. And at the end of every one, she looks at me and says, that was a horror movie? So we watched The Thing, and she says, that was a horror movie? 
yes, that was a horror movie. But to her, her interpretation of what a horror movie is is completely different than that. Yeah. She likes all these movies we're watching together, but she doesn't necessarily see them as horror movies. And I think there's a lot of that. I think that uh, because, in my view, the genre is a very wide category, wider than most people would ever file onto a bookshelf or in that section of the now non-existent video store. But I think that more people do embrace horror, but that, that title has that stigma attached to it. And I think, unfortunately, Colin, I think you're right. We're never going to break that down. Um, Christopher Lee famously said, this wouldn't have happened if we called it terror, but uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not convinced that uh, that does anything but maybe move the can a little bit further down the road. I'm going to start calling myself a terror writer, though, from now on. I'm changing, well, my, I'm changing my Twitter yeah. bio right now to terror. I'm going to call myself an, an uncanny writer from now on. Yes. I like that even more. <laughs> I'll well, you know what? Terror writer. I don't care. I'll do it both. I don't care. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Is anyone really going to argue with the man who taught Errol Flynn how to fence? I mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, I got I got a weird one here for you. Um, it's about our, our all of our final acts. I mean, after we're gone, how do you want to be remembered as it pertains to the genre? Because I think that very few people know how they'll be remembered, if if or how. Um, certainly, some some of our biggest names in the genre history went to their grave thinking they'd be completely forgotten. And you know what? Some of the people that probably should be remembered today were right in that assessment, unfortunately. But there's only so many Stephen Kings who know how they'll be remembered. So how do each of you want to uh, be thought of by your audience and maybe maybe beyond the audience too. Hey, way to hit us with an easy question. Yeah, well, no the, kidding. The, the, the next one's even harder, so don't worry. Great. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I'd like to be remembered as a writer who tried to um, show his readers the connections between uh, things like grief, loneliness, and violence, and how they how an individual tried to reconcile those things with the concept of a just universe where everything that they do, regardless of how big or how small, has some greater meaning because everybody's looking for a greater meaning in their lives. And I think that horror fiction, when it's done well, when it has the right intentions behind it, can be a form of supreme mythic literature. And I'd like to be remembered as someone who tried to, like, you know, get more people to you know, to look at it that way and maybe do, uh, maybe create things in that direction. Sarah, or I could just be remembered as a stunningly handsome tap dancer. Either way, it would, you know, that would be fine with me. Sarah? I don't, I don't know that I necessarily want to be remembered myself. I would love it if my books stuck around and people still read them, but I'm perfectly fine with being this nebulous, you know, unpersonaed entity <laughs> that, that end them. Um, you know, I, I kind of, I've always been an out of sight, out of mind kind of person where I just disappear when, when you're not looking at me. So I, I don't expect that anything will change when I'm gone. I think I will disappear when I'm gone. But as long as my books stick around, and maybe that's why I'm compelled to write them, who knows? Uh, as long as the books stick around, I'm good. It, it sounds like we should all be yeah. like going to our bathroom mirrors and saying Sarah's name is the mirror five times. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's what I took from that. <laughs> With the lights off and a candle. <laughs> well, sure. Yeah. Well, Professor T. Um, oh God, that's hard. Um, you know, with my with my poetry, I get a lot of the reviews that are like, "Oh, this is really beautiful and creepy." And then with my novella, it's like, "This is extremely disgusting, but also kind of beautiful." <laughs> so I think my angle is just writing things that are, you know, disturbing and upsetting and gross, but also showing the beauty and all of that too. So I guess if there's anything that my books can leave behind, it's just that sense of the beautiful macabre. I love yeah. the 
I, the glitter and gore was my catchphrase on another panel I did. So that's that's my tagline from now on. I like glitter that. and gore. <laughs> or the glittering gore. Glittery gore. Glittering gore. See, there's there so go. many ways you can yeah. have fun with it. <laughs> I wasn't making fun. I th that's actually. Oh no! I'll take it very it's actually, seriously. Yeah, it's actually <laughs> very. No, that's, that's actually a very. It's a very clever way to put it. <laughs> Thank you. So, Colin. So I've reached the age where I think about the end a lot, uh, <laughs> and I have. Uh, I've come to a realization: when this world finally takes me out, everybody else is already gone because I'm sticking around to the bitter end. <laughs> but let's say it doesn't play out the way I think it will. That I'm I go before everybody else. Uh I do want to be remembered for something by somebody. Uh even if it's just my kid, that he remembers that I wrote a bunch of stories he never bothered to read because he didn't like reading. You know. <laughs> um uh but in really I think, you know. I go through these dark patches sometimes and I, you know, I'll start waxing melancholy on Twitter or whatever. And I get people say, Hey, you know what? I know you're having a bad day, but you wrote a comic book that made me happy and made me smile this week. I'm like, you know, if I can be remembered that, Hey, I wrote a comic that made someone smile once or gave them a little bit of hope or gave them a little bit of happiness. Hey, that's fine. If that, if that's all I remember yeah. That's more than enough for me. That I entertain somebody at some point. Yeah, good point. Yep. Well, I'll, I'll say this, Cullen. Next time you get feeling bad, just remember that I'm the sucker that has a tattoo of something based on your work on it. That is so weird to me, man. It's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Look. Listen, I don't even have a tattoo of something based on my work. On I mean, uh, unfortunately, it's not direct. I mean, it's it's an interpretation of your work because it's it wouldn't be film, there. But without, I mean, exactly. I don't exactly. have a tattoo on this temple, and yet you. Oh, you I have, know. I have, I have probably too many. But interpretation uh, because copyright infringement. Got to be careful. Uh, well, <laughs> they have to come and take it then. Nobody's gonna uh, come. Uh, no. There you go. No. <laughs> um. And I would also say that, uh, Gary, I mean, I've said it to you before, but Indifference of Heaven destroyed me and recreated me at one point in my life. So, uh, I, and I, I'm not I'm not unique. There's other people with uh, tattoos of the empty man, and there's other people that had uh, cornerstone moments with all of your work, really. Believe me, you're, you're get, everything you're anticipating about being remembered isn't a shadow of what's going to happen. I, I certainly hope so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping that really what I'm trying to do is to try and figure out something in this mystery of mortality and morality that the genre is really based in so that I'll have something to say that resonates some small piece of our shared experience can, mm -hmm. can, can be a, I can be that footnote that um, I don't know how that plays out and I don't have a real roadmap there because God knows I don't plan, but um I'm just hoping there's something to be said that has not been said about our fear of the inevitable and how we live our lives on the road there, um, which is really what I think the horror genre is. It's kind of the most exaggerated and beautiful exploration of that concept. Yeah, Stephen King called every horror story a dress rehearsal for death. <laughs> and I, when I initially read that, I thought, oh, isn't that cute? But the, the older I get, and the more I think about it and the more I read in the genre, yeah, he's right. He's right. Uh, every, good, uh, every good horror story is basically a just rehearsal for your own death. And a few of those novels tried to kill me. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you dropped them on your foot or something. And, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I just wanted, I wanted to finish out with just a, a shout out to the works that, that are currently really giving us... Uh, you know, a reinvigorated view of the genre, or they don't have to be strictly in the genre, but, you know, what is that, what is the art at the moment that really has you fired up? Because I think as important as it is to talk to you guys about your own work, it's fascinating what you guys are inspired by as creators. 
and I'll actually start so you guys don't have to uh, just you know comb through the mental Rolodex. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm actually yeah. really impressed by something I'm reading right now from Allison. I'm going to screw up her last name. I'm sorry. Uh, Trinutin, uh called Pyrokinetic. It's sort of a young adult uh, novel. It's it's kind of like a more modern take on Firestarter, um, but it also has a whole lot of like real pathos to it. I, I'm about halfway through, and I got to say it's it's not at all what I expected it to be. It's way more, and um, she's a new writer on the scene. She deserves a lot more attention. I'm trying to get her on the show. She's a little shy, but you know what, Allison? You got to come on now because I just called you out with this audience. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm very excited by new voices all the time. I mean, before we went on there, I was telling Gary that um, the reason I stopped reading everything any one of my favorite writers put out is because there's too many good new voices, and I want to, I'm, I'm like scatterbrained. I want to grab all these new voices, I want to consume as many of them as I can. That's the most exciting thing for me right now, is just this incredible diversity of voice. And I don't mean that as diversity as in skin color or gender. I don't really care about that. I want all of you from everywhere, <laughs> just everywhere. Bring me your voices. If you have something unique to say, I want to hear it. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, tying, tying back into what we were talking about with the with eco horror and new monsters, I've really been enjoying you know Jeff Vandermeer's work lately. Um, I always have, but his his latest stuff has got just, I don't know, maybe it's it's got more impact and maybe that's just me. <laughs> but um, And then, yeah, like you were saying, these um, taking horror into new diverse voices. Um, I've really been loving um, V. Castro, Cena Palayo. Um, Stephen Graham Jones has always been my favorite horror author, but his latest stuff just bowls me over. I every time he has a new book come out, it's my new favorite of his, and it's, and it just keeps happening. Um, Sylvia Moreno Garcia taking gothic horror, which is my favorite, and just flipping it on its head, taking apart and putting it back together again, but better. Um, I love I love seeing what's happening to horror with so so many great voices. I've been um, I've been reading um, a lot of writers uh, along the lines of uh, Kelly Link and uh, Jeffrey Ford, um, who are basically genres unto themselves. But uh, Jeff really likes the horror genre, and every time he points out what he he says to me, that, well, this is a horror story, and I'll read it and go. Uh, Okay, yeah, sure, whatever you say, Jeff. Uh, but he he, um, he mixes everything up all the time. You can find almost every genre imaginable in any single one of his stories. I, I'd love to see the world through his eyes for just one day. And the same goes for the work of um, Kathy. Is it pronounced Koja or just Koj? Um, you know her. She, she seemed uh, her, okay when I called it Koja, so we're gonna go with that. Okay. Her, her most recent collection. Um, Velocities. Oh, my. Amazing. Amazing. My God, what an amazing achievement that is. And it's made me go back and start rereading some of her earlier work. Because at the time when she was bringing things out through the Abyss line, the Delray Abyss line, I felt like I was missing something. I actually felt kind of stupid when I started to read her stuff because I thought, well, there's something maybe this is like way over my head i'm glad i'm not the only one because i remember when those books were coming out yeah yeah and you know i've been going back and rereading stuff from the Della abyss line and that also enabled me to start rereading the work of the uh of the late melanie tem whose everything she did was just so exquisite um, especially her short stories. Um, you know, it, it, it's the type, she's the type of writer like with Brian Hodge that you will read one of her collections and by the time you're finished, you want to close the book and become a cesspool cleaner like your mommy <laughs> wanted in the first place. Um, it's just, the, the writing is just exquisite. And it's, you know, for me, I'm, I'm discovering both new writers and going back and rediscovering writers that 
when they um, first began to emerge, I didn't have I didn't have the capacity to really appreciate what it was they were doing. So uh, I guess I'll go. <laughs> um, so it's interesting. Gary brings up the uh, abyss line because I've been rereading um, the Borderlands anthologies, which to me yeah. uh, were coming out around around the same time as that abyss line when I was working at Walden Books way back in the day, and those books were coming out. And I've been rereading the the Borderlands anthologies, and they're so good. I mean, they hold up. 1000 percent to anything you're going to read today they're great mm -hmm. uh so uh i've been rereading that stuff um but i also like uh i'm really getting into uh a lot of you know a lot of people who are just taking chances and going out and just they're not waiting for someone to uh to green light them to to give them permission they're just going out and tell stories michael patrick hicks uh his resurrectionist book is awesome uh it's a uh, sort of a you know, a period piece cosmic horror story. He's got the second book is already out. They're great. Um, I just so always in a, within arm's reach. I just got this book, uh, Colonel February and the Yellow House. And this is by <laughs> a guy named Jimmy McGann. And he messaged me, I don't know, a, within a year ago asking what he should do to get his, his book out. And it was such a bizarre combination of comic and prose. I was like, I don't know who's going to do it, but maybe just do it yourself. And he just put this thing out and it's, it's surreal and gorgeous and bizarre. It's part poetry, part comic, part prose. It's this guy on the page. And, and I love it. I love that. It, it, I'm not saying it's perfect. Maybe for some people it is. I'm just saying when you read this book, this is that guy on the page. Every, he bled on those pages and you can tell. And, uh, and I just got The Hungry Snow yesterday uh, by Joe R. Lansdale, uh, which to me is a big deal because the first short story I ever sold to uh, a magazine was a complete ripoff of Dead <laughs> to the West by Joe Lansdale. <laughs> and the magazine folded before the story ever came out, but it has always been, that's always been my first professional sale was that, that crappy ripoff of Dead in the West. So, uh, I haven't read this one yet, but I'm super excited because it's a return to the character of uh, Dead in the West. So awesome. Okay. Um, so for me, there's so many, but I'll, I'll narrow it down. A book I just finished reading was Haley Piper's Queen of Teeth, which is her debut novel. Mm -hmm. um, the special hardback's out and the paperback comes out a little later this year. And it's just so good and it's so different and it's probably unlike anything else you're going to read for a very long time. Um, so if that's not on your radar or your TBR list, just jot it down, follow Haley and make sure you know when it's coming out. The but queen it's of just teeth. Queen, the queen of teeth. Yeah, there's. I've written down so many titles already. <laughs> yeah. of the stuff that I got to check out now. Yeah, it's it's so good and it's so un unapologetic in the way it like looks at horror through a queer lens, through the lens of a woman. There's you know vagina teeth and tentacles. I don't know what more you could want in a book besides that. Um, so that's a great one. Also, a forever favorite of mine is Linda Addison, who everyone knows yes. her poetry. But she's also just an incredible human being and yeah. constantly inspires me. I love listening to her. Her stories of her entire life are so moving and just such a great example of the things that you can accomplish when you when you try and you keep working. And such a good example of someone who gives back to the community too, which yeah. is something I think we just can't forget. And since I'm an hour from Pittsburgh, I have to promote that um the pittsburgh horror university archives we are archiving the hwa and all their work so about an hour from me um i think the first people they're archiving are linda and kathy koja since we mentioned her but they'll be curating all these unique pieces from these horror writers that people may have never seen before like their originals their notes their original manuscripts um, so definitely keep an eye on that too. I think it's going to be really exciting to see what all the um, archive gets for their collection. And it's also where the Romero, Romero archives are too. Cool. Yeah. 
I just drove through Pittsburgh. I don't think they're open it's to the public yet at the archive, but as soon as they are, I'm going to make a road trip too. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. I, I'm allowed to go in soon because <laughs> I, co I co organize the Pittsburgh HWA chapter with my Garnson, so we're going to sneak in a visit soon. Um, yeah, so we're excited. <laughs> Wear a camera and then email me the footage. I'll try. I might get arrested. You should offer up. Vagina with teeth and tentacles. What more do you need in a horror novel as a blurb? I did, Seriously, I, I would, did blurb I would it, buy. but I did not that. <laughs> well, uh, you know, there's always a, a clip from the show that starts these roundtables. That's a, that's sure, it. I might just have gotten it. I'm just yep. saying. <laughs> Next <laughs> on Visited by Voices, Vaginas with Teeth and Tentacles. What more do you need? Yeah, that's perfect. Are you sold on "Visited by Voices" as the title of this? Because I think you may have. Well, yep. we'll see. We'll test market it on the side. We'll see what happens. So many of so many like incredible writers' names that were just mentioned, whether it's Brian Hodge or Melanie Tan. Um, I, I roundabout Gene Cavello's patron saint of this channel in many ways because yep. we are Della Best people around here. Uh, Tom Monteleone with the Borderlands anthologies. I mean, oh my, we're getting a new one, by the way, but oh my God. What? Yeah. I mean, it's I happening. I well, they just released, he just released number seven. Yeah. And he, he's already got eight in the works. That's my understanding from a very reliable source that we both know. All right. All okay. right. I'll write it down. Um, another another edition. Stephen Graham Jones and Sylvia Marino Garcia. I mean, the, the, these are people who both past, present, and future um, just have inspired me. And it can, they all continue to beat at the walls of what we call horror. Like, none of them are just sitting in place and just content with just to, to tell the Bram Stoker thing again, right? These are all people that are doing the important work. So, I mean, it's so heartwarming to see the love for these people. It's amazing. Yeah, and you guys... You look at Stephen Graham Jones's work. The oh my God, the 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 legends and the folk tales and everything else from his culture that he's got to he's got to draw from. You know, I I think that um, the only good Indian is going to be regarded as a cornerstone of the new horror movement fifty years from now. People are going to be still reading that particular novel half a century from now. Absolutely, and I want Hollywood to stay the fuck away from it because you know what they'll do to it, right? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> the only yeah, thing that will remain is the elk head woman. The rest of it will be a slasher film. I get that money, though. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's true. <laughs> Look, that's true. I'm being selfish and, and have my regard, but... Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, you guys are every bit as amazing. You are great voices, and um, thank you so much for coming on tonight. And, yeah, thank uh, you. And with me. These are always fun. They always go fast. An hour goes by in the blink of a hat, and um, blink of a hat is not even a metaphor. I don't know what I just did there. I just drove 10 hours. Relax. Okay. You're All excused. Right. So I want to thank you guys, and we'll see you real soon. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yep. Bye. It was nice meeting everyone.